Greetings. Happy New Year. I'm Krista Jan Ryan, and I am your host today for Artist in the Berkshires, where we bring to you the artist whose vision has made an impact in the art world. So today's show, folks, concludes our musical marathon from the summer, and it is listed as Literary Potpourri, where we bring to you some really dynamic artists who really have a magnificent performance and grasp of what the art world is really about. So I hope you enjoy the show. Um, I know one that um, my uh, voice teacher and I just finished working on. It's called Stil wie die Nacht, which translates to still as the night. Uh, it basically says, still as the night, as deep as the sea, that's how I love you, as strong as stone. Um, I'm, I'm terrible at German, so I can't remember what the line after that means, but that's basically the gist of it. There's also another one that I know. I, um, I actually taught this one to myself. It's called Rolling Girl. Um, this one isn't in German. This one's in Japanese. Um, the translation is basically, um, well, it says, um, just once more, just once more, I'm going to roll again. And when she says roll, she means I'm going in circles. I don't see what's going on. I don't see a way out. I don't understand. Um, it's saying, um, it's saying that she feels like she's going in circles, and um, people will ask if she's okay, and she goes, "No, I don't see the future. I don't see what's going on. I don't see how am I going to turn out good now because even the hills are tempting me to make mistakes." Um, let me see if I can remember. Rolling girl, why to my day more? Todo can I make me take? So I no naga wa kaki ma wa shi te kaki ma wa shi te mon tai dai to subu ya 
There's another one. Um, it's called Vedrai Carino. This one is in Italian. Oh. <laughs> I'm. <laughs> um, it's uh, it's from um, Mozart's Don Giovanni, um, when um, the character Zerlina is comforting her husband, who has just gotten beaten up really bad by Don Giovanni, and this is her. This is her attempt to comfort him a little bit. Composing scales beside the rails that flanked a field of corn, a farmer's boy with vicious joy performed upon a horn. The vagrant airs, the fragrant airs around the field that strayed, 
took flight before the flagrant airs that noisome urchin played. He played with care the maiden's prayer. He played God save the queen, de Wachrem Rhein and Auld Lang Syne and wearing of the green. With futile toots and brutal toots and shrill chromatic scales and utterly in noodle toots and agonizing wails. The while he played around him strayed and calmly chewed the cud, some thirty-nine assorted kine, all ankle deep in mud. They stamped about and tramped about that field till all the troop made noises as they ramped about like schoolboys eating soup. Till growing bored, with one accord they broke the fence forlorn. The field was doomed. The cows consumed two-thirds of all the corn. Most idle ass of all your class, the farmer said with scorn. Just see, my lad, what you have done. The cows are in the corn. Oh, drat, he said, the brat, he said. The cowherd seemed to rouse. <laughs> my friend, it's worse than that, he said. The corn is in the cows. The moral lies before our eyes. When tending kine and corn, don't spend your noons in tooting tunes upon a blatant horn or railing and assailing and with energy immense. Your cows will take a railing and the farmer take offense. And the other, <clears throat> Little Miss Muffet discovered a tuffet, which never occurred to the rest of us, and as was a June day and just about noonday, she wanted to eat, like the best of us. Her diet was whey, and I hasten to say it is wholesome, and people grow fat on it. The spot being lonely, the lady not only discovered the tuffet, but sat on it. A rivulet gabbled beside her and babbled as rivulets always are thought to do, and dragonflies sported around and cavorted as poets say dragonflies ought to do. When, glancing aside for a moment, she spied a horrible sight that brought fear to her. A hideous spider had sat down beside her and most unavoidably near to her. Albeit unsightly, this creature politely said, Madam, I earnestly vow to you, I am penitent that I did not bring my hat. I should otherwise certainly bow to you. Although anxious to please, he was so ill at ease that he lost all his sense of propriety and grew so inept that he clumsily stepped in her plate which is barred in society. This curious error completed her terror, and growing much paler, she not only left Tuffet, but dealt him a buffet, which doubled him up in a sailor knot. <gasps> I frightened you, no doubt of it, he said. Your fist's like a truncheon. You're still in my luncheon, was all that she answered. Get out of it. And the moral is this, be it madam or miss, to whom you have something to say, you are only absurd when you get in the curd, but you're rude when you get in the way. Now, this is actually a story that I wrote for a friend of mine who was in the hospital, and I wanted to make him feel worse. Uh, actually, <clears throat> uh, I wanted to make him feel better, so this was written to be as ridiculous as possible, and it's my magnificent sea epic. Quick now, quick now, the captain of the king's osprey cried. That's cried in the shouting sense, uh, not the weeping one. As the deck pitched and heaved violently, Mr. Blockhead, the first mate, and Mr. Blackhead, the second mate, stove in the lids of two huge barrels and tipped them over. A viscous pink fluid gushed out and splattered over the deck. Spread it, the captain cried, still in the shouting sense, obviously. Spread it and be 
I'm Taya. The crew at once waded in with their mops and swabs and hastily began smearing the Pepto-Bismol all over the deck, mopping and brushing it into every corner until the deck stopped heaving. Steady on, the captain called. Steady. All at once, a huge, loud belch erupted out of the hold. The crew scrambled to put on their gas masks, but just then a wind came out of the east and blew the fumes away. The crew gave a collective sigh of relief. Arr, the captain said, that were a close one. Indeed it were, sir, agreed Mr. Blackhead. Say, Captain, said Bennington Bill, one of the youngest and least experienced sailors on the ship. The captain rolls his eyes in resignation. All right, Captain, now what? Well, sir, I was just wondering if it wouldn't be a good idea to have some women aboard the ship for the men to socialize with, sir. What? the captain bellowed, swinging his arm violently to cuff the young sailor's ear. Unfortunately, the young sailor was standing five feet away, so the swing went wide, knocking the faithful skipper off balance. Then he lost his footing on the Pepto-Bismol and fell to the deck with a resounding splat. At once, a dozen hands reached out to help him to his feet. He slapped them away impatiently, struggled for a minute, then angrily waved them back. The seaman heaved the captain to his feet, and he stalked toward Bennington Bill in an icy rage. What be this nonsense you be prattling on a boot? Well, sir, Bennington Bill answered, studies have shown that people who socialize with members of the opposite sex in the workplace as well as out of it work up to 50% more efficiently than them that doesn't. So as I was thinking that if we added about 30 women to the crew, we could improve our efficiency ratings by a good 20 or 30%, sir. Not that I'm trying to tell you how to run your own ship, sir. I wouldn't do that, seeing as I'm one of the youngest and least experienced sailors aboard the ship sir, but I was thinking it were part of me duty to share with you any ideas I had that you might think might make things work more smoothly, sir, and I was of the opinion that this is a pretty good idea and worth bringing to your august attention, sir, and what's more, the captain moaned in agony. His crew staggered about him, clutching their ears in a hopeless attempt to block the torrent of words. The captain considered swatting the young sailor a second time from a closer range this time, but decided against it, having no desire to slip on the Pepto-Bismol again. Quit your blather and your blather, Skite, he bellowed, stamping his little feet in rage. His boots made little splatty sounds on the Pepto-Bismol. Don't you know it's bad luck to have a woman aboard a ship? What's that, he said, Captain, Mr. Blackhead said. I said it's bad luck to have a woman aboard a ship. What does it mean? It don't sound like no proper word to me, sir. It's, the captain shrieked. It's, it is. Ah, Mr. Blockhead answered. Thank you, Captain. Have you ever considered consulting a speech therapist, sir? Bennington Bill chimed in. Sure, it's wonders they can do if you're willing to mind your own business. The captain roared in apoplectic fury. Now be off with you and scrape the barnacles off in the keel. And mind you don't come up for air oftener than 20 minutes at a time. Several of the sailors seized Bennington Bill helpfully and tossed him over the side. The captain sagged against the rail, sighing in relief. Do it really be bad luck to have a woman aboard a ship? Asked Bilgewater Bill, one of the oldest and most experienced sailors aboard the ship. The captain turned to him in horror. Of course it is. Is it nothing you know about sailors' folklore? Well, sir, Berkshire Bill is a woman, sir. The captain gasped out loud. Is it daft you are? Berkshire Bill a woman? Why, he's one of the... Butchest men that I sailed the sea. Where'd you ever get a fool idea like that then? Well, sir, came the thoughtful reply. I've seen him rinsing out his lingerie, sir. And I've heard him giving advice to some of the men about how to select parfum, sir. And why, that's foolish, the captain answered. How do you know it was even his lingerie, hey? Well, I know how to settle this. He turned and called, Berkshire Bill, report to me at once and be quick about it. 
Here he comes, sir, Bilgewater Bill said, seeing one of the sailors drop what he was doing and march across the deck toward them. The spiked heels of his sturdy sea boots clicked firmly as he walked, and his hips swayed manfully from side to side. Aye, Captain, Berkshire Bell said, saluting smartly and fixing his deep, smoky eyes on the captain's red-rimmed, watery ones. The captain's liver and pancreas were dancing the tango on his stomach. Aye, Bill, aye, the captain replied, unable to tear his eyes away from Berkshire Bill's exquisitely creamy complexion. There be a rumor going about the ship that there be a woman. <laughs> did, did you ever hear anything so ridiculous in your life? Berkshire Bill shook his head, his immaculately coiffed blonde hair ruffling in the breeze and emitting a tantalizing scent of Chanel Number no. 5. Never, sir, Berkshire Bill answered, his ruby pouting lips parting in an animal snarl that revealed flawless white teeth. The captain's kidney stepped out on the dance floor and started an energetic lindy. Nudging Bilgewater Bill's ribs, the captain found his eyes trailing down to Berkshire Bill's burly 39-inch bust. Well, he said, I guess that settles that. <laughs> now, now be off with you and get back to work. I, Captain Berkshire Bell answered, spinning deftly on his heel, then began slinking away. The captain cleared his throat carefully. Uh, and uh, uh, Bill, the seaman turned, casting a seductive look over his shoulder. I, sir? The captain blinked painfully as his internal organs broke into the frug. I think, uh, I, I think you'd best stop in your cabin and take off that evening gown. Uh, not, not that it's not nice or nothing, but I think you'll work better in a pantsuit or something. I, Captain Berkshire Bell answered and walked away, his firm buttocks bouncing manfully with each step. The captain sagged against the rail, breathing heavily. Well then, <laughs> let that be a lesson to you, Mr. Bilgewater. Aye, sir, aye, Village Water Bill answered in a strained voice. Well, if you'll excuse me, sir, I'll just be off and take a cold shower. Aye, the captain replied. Just don't be using all the cold water. I'll be wanting one myself. Thank you. As Krista, as Krista mentioned, I am from Ticonderoga, uh, which is an Indian word meaning place with no movie theater. Um, I live up in the boondocks, and actually, uh, if you translate the word boondocks into Mohawk, it is Adirondacks. So, uh, I, uh, I grew up in a family where there was a lot of humor. Um, a lot of times, it was at somebody else's expense, and many times, my own. Uh, so, um, my story is about being transformed by the love of Jesus Christ, and 12-step programs from being a victim to a victor. Uh, names have been changed to protect the innocent. That's me. And uh, this, is, this is also me. Can you see this? Black sheep. Um, but the Lord is my shepherd. So I'd like to introduce to you Arnold. Hello, my name is Arnold, and uh, I'm self-unemployed. That's right, I'm out of business for myself. Uh, I have extensive experience in the field of unemployment. Um, I was an actor uh, for 15 years. I, I never got any parts, but I auditioned a lot. You know, I, the way I prepared for the audition, I'd uh, go to my apartment, I'd practice waiting. I just um, stand around for a couple hours. <laughs> then I go to the audition, they call my name, they say, Arnold, it's your turn. I'd say, it's okay, I'll wait. Uh, a lot of the parts I auditioned for, um, w one of the parts at least, was a, a victim role, and they asked me if I could play the part. I said, I've been rehearsing all my life. Uh, I was raised during the Depression, my mother's, <laughs> my father was kind of distant he used to ring, wear a name tag around the house. Hello, my name's Daddy. My brothers teased me a lot. I had a birthday cake, no candles for the cake. They shined a flashlight on it and said, blow it out. 
Um, I was a very shy kid. Somebody wrote my high school yearbook, great getting to know you, Terry. <laughs> it's not my name. Um, I went to the University of Notre Dame, which is kind of a, a rah-rah school. Um, there are inscriptions on the desk there like, God is great, God is good, go God, go. Um, Notre Dame is the home of big time religious football. Uh, we had quarterbacks calling signals. Luke 13, 23, Deuteronomy 10, hop on. We lost, it was a sin. There like guys lined up at the confessional after the game, bless me father, if I fumbled. I had to get away from all that guilt, you know. I fled to New York City, but I was still haunted by my Catholic back background. I, uh, I heard the subway announcements in Gregorian chant. This is the D train. Across the platform is the F. Next stop is 34th Street. I, I, I had to get away from all that guilt, you know. I had to find a loving God, a, a God who could understand me. And I found him in church, of all places. I said, God, what, what are you doing in church? Shouldn't you be out working? He said, I need a rest too. I like that. Then he sneezed. I didn't know what to say, you know. But I realized it wasn't so important where I worshiped, just so God was at the center, so I went shopping for churches. I called up the Fragmentarian Church. I said, where are you located? They said, we're all over the place. I called up the Norman Church. They followed teachings of Norman. <laughs> Norman has this way of dealing with low self-esteem. Goes in the bathroom in the morning, looks at himself in the mirror, says, Norman, I love you. I tried that. I, I went to the bathroom, looked at myself in the mirror. I said, Norman, I love you. I didn't like myself any better, but I liked Norman a lot more. I, I went to the Church of the Enunciation. Not so important what you believe, just how you say it. A after all that, the Catholic Church didn't seem so bad to me. I mean, churches change penalties and purgatory for venial sin are down to 46 months. Um, they have face-to-face -face confession they call reconciliation. You walk in, the priest says, uh, I'll tell you mine if you tell me yours. So I'm a, I'm a refried Christian, and as a Christian, I have to ask myself, you know, how would Jesus deal with this world we live in today? Would he have to apply for a position as Messiah? Step in, Mr. Nazareth. I um, see you fed the water. You fed, uh, you changed the water to wine and the wedding feast, you fed 5,000. Have you thought of catering? You know, you're only, only as good as your last miracle. What have you done lately? <laughs> so uh, I started out in social work, um, but it was just too crazy for me. I, I needed a senior occupation to fall back on, so I, uh, I went into show business. Um, I'm living proof to the old adage, old social workers never die, they just become inappropriate. Uh, I have a graduate degree in, in social work, which is a, uh, a graduate degree in codependency. You know, you, you've heard of doctors without borders. I, I'm in social workers without boundaries. Um, I get fired a lot. <laughs> I've got advice how, how you know, I, I, think, I think this is a good thing, you know, because I have the ability to alienate entire groups of people, you know, against me. Bosses and coworkers alike band together to form a united front to get rid of me. I think that takes leadership skills. Um, I, I, you know, a lot of the jobs I get fired from, I uh, get from the one ads in the New York Times. Uh, one ad said, uh, seeking a social worker, aggressive and independent. I, I went right up to the interviewer, pushed him, and said, I don't need you and you can keep your stupid job. He hired me as an anti-social worker, you know. People come to me for help and I'd say, listen, you think you have problems, get out of my office. Uh, it got so bad, you know, that uh, I was getting fired before I even started a job. You know, this one job, I, I filled out the application and I said to the lady, um, so do I have the job? She said, yes, but unfortunately we're going to have to let you go. I said, I didn't even start yet. She said, yeah, but it's, uh, it, it's not going to work out, so um, 
you know, clean off your desk. I, I said, I, I, don't, I don't have a desk yet. She said, pick one and clean it off. Uh, so, I don't know, social work, you know, is a very stressful occupation. It's like a burnout occupation, you know, and the stress takes a toll on your body. Um, my back went out uh, the other night. I had to go back out after it. Um, so I went to an osteopath. Um, if you have problems with people, do you go to a sociopath? Um, I did, I went to one guy, he was an addiction specialist, I mean, he specialized in addiction. Um, and I identify with him, you know, we had a lot in common. I'm, I'm an addict, alcoholic, compulsive overreader, chronic under earner, workaholic, codependent. Uh, I've got about eight addictions, actually, uh, very versatile. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was voted on the All East Coast compulsive team. Um, I, I really wish I could specialize, you know, like, like focus on one addiction like alcohol or drugs. I really admire who, people who can commit to one thing, um, but I just get distracted. I, I'm like a garden variety addict. Uh, my, my hobbies include obsessing. Well, that takes up most of my time. Um, in college, I majored in entomology. That's the study of entomans. Uh, I, um, I came into 12-step programs and um, you know, they said to me, you know, when I started, 12-step um, programs, you know, are a bridge to life, actually. For me, it was a tunnel to nine other programs. I'm in so much recovery, I have no life. But who needs a life when you're always getting better? Unlike my friend Jane, she's in so many 12-step programs, she doesn't know who she is anymore. And none of her friends would tell her because they don't want to break her anonymity. Um, <laughs> My therapist is, you know, very enthusiastic about my case. He, he diagnosed me as a multiple 12-step personality. Uh, he's so excited, he wanted to take my picture. He said, could all of you move in a little closer? Um, I think it goes back to when I was a kid. I, I spent a lot, a lot of time alone, and uh, I would talk to myself to keep myself company. One day I broke into an argument. My mother walked in the room and said, I don't have to separate you two. Um, and I'm trying to adjust to life as a multiple. You know, I, I went to the movies the other day, and, uh, you know, the girl at the box office said, so how many are you? I said, well, actually, five. Um, and she wanted to charge me for each personality, you know. And the next time I went back, I wised up, you know. She said, how many are you? I said, one adult multiple. She still wanted to charge
written by Doreen Newton, a local Berkshire woman. <clears throat> Go ahead. Oh, let it rip. Okay, KK, come on in. This next song was recorded by a group in a Kentucky state prison.
will find my strength in the shadow of your wings. Your love, oh Lord, reaches to the Thank you, ladies. Oh, jeez. <laughs> um, now he's going to speak into this. And so our last and best part of the evening is from uh, the Message of Hope, which is brought to you by Pastor Peter Grimes from Hope Fellowship Church, who drove all the way down from, I don't know where you were today, but he lives in Cambridge, but he was probably up further north. So anyway, folks, this concludes our night. And I just wanted to leave you with not only hope, but the message of love. Mm. Thank you for joining us. Amen. I want to thank our singers here. They, they uh, had such beautiful voices. They were great. And the, uh, our Holy Spirit, who was... Uh, dancing before us. Amen. I am Peter Grimes, pastor of Hope Fellowship that's uh, located in uh, Bennington, Vermont. And uh, we uh, meet Sunday mornings at 1030. And uh, you are more than welcome to, uh, to come. I uh, would like to end this uh, telethon uh, today with uh, just a brief message. Um, a brief message of, of hope and love. And just want you to know how much God loves us and how much God loves you. And, and it's sometimes so hard to con conceive, but he really does. He really does love us. I like to give God praise um, by reading uh, one of the praises from uh, Psalm 111. And it says, I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. The works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them. His work is honorable and is glorious, and his righteousness endures forever. He has made his wonderful works to be remembered the Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He has given food to those who fear him. He will even be mindful of his covenant. He has declared to his people the power of his works and giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are verity and justice, all his precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. He has sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. And it does forever and ever and ever. God loves us. Even with the song that, that talked about the wounded children. We're all God's children. We're all wounded, all broken, broken since the day Adam and Eve broke the, the commandment that was given to them by God. All of us suffer because of that great sin. But God loves us. He treats us all the same. He sends rain to the just and to the unjust. The sun shines on the just and the unjust. That's how loving our Father is. 
He loves us with, with such a great love that we cannot fathom it. It is powerful. And he cares so much about each and every one of us. Sometimes I, I scratch my head and I wonder, how can he, 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 he care about me? One of five or six billion people on the face of the earth. But he does. He does. He cares for each and every one of us. That's our God. Our God. And one day, we're going to see him face to face. Those that have not known him will see him in a different way. Those that have known God and have put their trust and faith in him, man, there's going to be a time that is bliss. It's going to be a time that is going to be so joyful and pleasant. This message is to those that, that don't know our Savior and really never taken a chance to, to find out who he is. This message is a message of hope. The Bible tells us that there is no hope in, in those who, who have no God or does not have this God. There are plenty of gods, gods all over the place. But the one true God who has revealed himself to the world through Abraham. This is the God that the Bible talks about and follows all the way through. There's nothing like it. No works ever written can compare to what we have in the word of God that was given to us, a word of truth. There's no uh, false, falseness in this. Pure truth. God loves us. If you don't know Christ, because I tell you, the wrath of God hangs over the whole world. The whole world. And as much as he still loves us, he still has to has to punish us because of sin. There's no escape. At least, that's what most people think. But God gave us his only son to die for us, to deliver us from our sins. His only son who put himself on the line he didn't have to, but because of his great love for his father, his great love for us, it was not a problem for him to do that, to die for us. So is there an escape from the wrath of God? Yes, to those who have come in faith Embracing Jesus Christ as the Son of God who come to this earth to live and to die for us, each and every one of us. And all those that, that grab hold of, of Jesus and put all their trust in him, the Bible tells us will have everlasting life. The Bible tells us that when we come to, to him, that he will forgive us of our sins, all of them, past, present, future. That's our God. And, and once that's done, he can look at you with such love and be able to, to, to have that relationship that he once had. What a God. If there's anyone out there in TV land that does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior for themselves, it's simple. 
Sometimes it's so simple that people can't even believe it. But it's just confessing your sin. God is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. And he promised us everlasting life. Though we may die in these bodies, when we, our spirit, enters into his kingdom, we will live forever. Forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord God. I thank you that you came to me as you will come to the one out there that is looking for answers, looking for life. And that you, Lord God, will reveal yourself in such a real way. You tell us that if we seek you, you will be found. And when that happens, you will begin to open up our eyes and open up the doors to our hearts to receive us. And I'm asking that if there is anyone out there that has called out to Jesus and has invited him into your heart to receive Jesus with all that the, the faith that, that you have, you will receive him. And I ask that, Jesus, you would take them and that you would begin to live your life through him and that you, Lord God, would begin to show him how to live the Christian life that we have read so much about, that we have seen so much of that they will have that for themselves, this personal relationship with Jesus Christ. If there's anyone that has, has uh, invited Jesus in this way, by faith, accepting him as Lord and believing that he died for your sin, welcome into the family of God. Praise you. Thank you. And I thank you. Amen. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed that. It was uh, a lot of fun for me, and uh, it was great to be able to cull together people that have been on my show through the last six years. And you have been watching Artist in the Berkshires. I am your host, which is Krista Jan Ryan, and I bring to you the artist whose vision has made an impact in the art world. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time, and Happy New Year. Today.